it's Kyle with Liberty and Me here with Dr. Roderick Long here at the University of Oklahoma where he will be giving a speech today on uh, eudaimonistic approaches to libertarianism. Dr. Long is professor of philosophy at Auburn University, a senior fellow at the Ludwig von Mises Institute, a fellow at the C4SS, president of the Molinari Institute. He writes for Bleeding Heart Libertarians, Reason Magazine, and seems to be simply everywhere at all times. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Long. Great to be here. So uh, your talk is eudaimonistic approaches to libertarianism, uh, and Merriam-Webster defines that as a theory that the highest ethical goal is personal happiness and well-being. Uh, how does this differ from objectivism or uh, Sternerite egoism, and uh, what does it have to offer libertarianism? Okay, well, and by eudaimonism, I mean eudaimonism in the sort of the classical sense we find in the ancient Greek philosophers. I think one thing that's distinctive about it is the idea that virtue, moral virtue, is a constitutive part of well-being, uh, not merely an instrumental means to it. So that certainly distinguishes it from Sternerism, which doesn't have, a, uh, have, at least in any ordinary sense, a role for moral virtue. With objectivism, it's tricky to tell to what extent we're supposed to think of moral virtue as part of self-interest for the objectivist, to what extent it's supposed to be an instrumental means. And when you read Rand's novels, I think a kind of a eudaimonistic feel is what I get from them. Uh, but when Rand goes to lay philosophical foundations for the values she presents in her novels, in, in the nonfiction, it seems to me that it's kind of a complex, indirect, instrumental argument that she's giving. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, on a more Aristotelian view or Socratic view, uh, it's not that virtue is some kind of good strategy for achieving your self-interest, but it's actually part of what it is. So what does that have to offer libertarianism? Well, uh, libertarianism, there's been this long debate between uh, deontological and consequentialist, or you might say natural rights versus utilitarian uh, approaches. And one of the interesting things about eudaimonism, there's at least many versions of eudaimonism, has this kind, have this kind of unity of virtue thesis, where the idea is that the content of each virtue is partly uh, determined by the contents of the other virtues. So, for example, uh, if you have courage, which is the, the virtue of deciding when to face danger and when not, and if you add, you know, which risks are worth taking, and then you have, let's say, justice, which is about, you know, for example, paying your debts. Well, what if, in order to pay a debt, you, you have to do something risky? Cases where it's risky to pay your debt. You know, you have to walk through a dangerous neighborhood to return the thing or whatever. Um, so that uh, courage plays a role in deciding whether that's a risk worth taking, Justice decides, you know, what counts as an excuse for not paying your debt. So you can't really determine the content of one of them apart from the other. Well, one thing that means is that uh, a, a highly consequence-oriented virtue like benevolence or prudence is going to partly be determined by and partly determine the content of a more deontological uh, virtue like justice. So that the content of our rights is going to be partly influenced by consequential considerations, but it goes the other way too. It's not a one-way street. What counts as a good consequence is partly going to be determined by uh, ideas about justice. So we start off with kind of prima facie contents for these things, and then we work with a kind of mutual adjustment uh, to uh, get something more concrete. Sure. So why should uh, libertarians read someone like Foucault? Why should libertarians branch out from what is considered the traditional libertarian canon, at least in America. And uh, what are some thinkers that you enjoy, that you draw from a lot, uh, who are outside of that libertarian canon? Okay, well, Foucault is someone who is really interested in issues about power, the nature of power, the nature of domination. Uh, he's going to initially turn off a lot of libertarians because he's interested in forms of power that don't violate the non-aggression principle. And so, you know, a lot of libertarians get very nervous because they think, well, if you're talking about this as a form of power, but it's not a form of aggression, that means you want to ban something that isn't aggression. And they worry about that. But you can be interested in and concerned about forms of power without necessarily thinking that, you know, coercive state force is the right way uh, to solve them. And there's a... Um, uh, you know, people sometimes think of Foucault as being kind of hyper-pessimistic because he sees sort of power relations everywhere and he seems to think that even strategies for liberating ourselves from harmful forms of power uh, tend to you know, have the danger of turning into some sort of oppressive form of power as well. But there's a quote that I know you, you know I like from Foucault, which is, is that 
our, the claim is not that everything is bad, the claim is that everything is dangerous. In other words, you know, power relations per se aren't bad. There are certain kinds of power relations, ones he calls domination, that severely restrict your options, he thinks are bad. But it's not that every power relation is bad. I mean, we're sort of, you know, society is constituted by power relations. But power relations always run the risk of turning into domination. And domination is something to be fought, not necessarily by state means. Uh, you know, Foucault wasn't, although I, don't, I wouldn't call him an anarchist, he was not that big a fan of state action, um, but fought through other kinds of means, and so he says, you know, it's not pessimism, it's sort of hyperactivism. Uh, now, on um, uh, another theorist that uh, libertarians should be fond of, well, here's an example of someone who's very much influenced by Foucault, Judith Butler. Uh, you know, she's become famous among libertarians for being the most obscure writer ever, which she really is not. Uh, you know, I mean, she's, she's not easy reading, but compared to, you know, a lot of people in academia, you know, she's fairly straightforward. And she's someone libertarians should be more interested in because she's uh, argued strongly on feminist grounds against censorship of pornography and things like that, that, uh, you know, that a lot of feminists uh, uh, would disagree with her on. So, you know, she's in some ways a potential ally of libertarians. Uh, so libertarians are sort of making fun of her for being an obscure writer, kind of missing uh, the point. Sure. You're a fan of uh, science fiction and uh, fantasy literature, correct? I think that's safe to say. Okay, okay. Um, you know, a lot of libertarians are uh, drawn to the philosophy, or I say a lot, you know, it's possible that some are drawn to the philosophy by writers like Robert Heinlein. Uh, so, who are some of your favorite science fiction or fantasy authors, and uh, is there a way that they have influenced your philosophy? Okay, hey, well, yeah. Um I am, uh, you know, one guy I'm a fan of is Ken McLeod. He's a, a Scottish science fiction writer who, two of whom his chief influences are libertarianism and Marxism, uh, which he combines in some sort of interesting ways. He's got this four-part series called The Fall Revolution, uh, where, you know, one of the main characters is a Trotskyite mercenary, and... At one point, one of the characters says, "You know, you keep you know you keep talking about Trotsky and you keep talking about markets. I don't get it. You know, how do you combine these?" And he says, "Well, look, what we really meant by socialism, what we the core of what we wanted from socialism, was not some kind of you know vast top-down bureaucratic control. What we want is is people to be you know free from being bossed around and so forth, free to live their own lives and mutual aid and all that. And it looks like the best way to achieve that is in a market. Let us outcompete hierarchical capitalism." Uh, you know, mentioning Ken McLeod makes me think of another Scottish science fiction writer who died recently. It was a friend of his, Ian Banks, who was not a fan of libertarianism. Uh, he said some very critical things about it, but uh, he was a, um, a kind of uh, utopian anarchist, a technological utopian anarchist. He wrote a series of books about the culture, which is uh, a society, an anarchist society that is... Uh, you know, ultra high tech, post scarcity, so that uh, technology has developed to the point that um, that uh, markets are no longer needed, and uh, you know why uh, we disagree with some of his economic ideas. I think that the you know this idea that that uh, you know technolo technology can decrease the extent to which we rely on markets uh, is actually a more libertarian idea than people, than people think, um, and that markets themselves can decrease the extent to which we rely on markets. So Bastia, for example, says, well, there's a sense in which I'm a communist because what we want is to increase the common domain. We want to increase the number. We want to, we want to make things lower priced. We want to make things less costly. And the ultimate end goal of that is, you know, things that are zero cost or as close to zero cost as we can get. Uh, but he thinks that markets tend to do that, whereas Ian Banks would be suspicious of that claim. But that, uh, in general, the uh, you know, process of competition, driving down prices, making things more efficient. The element go is to increase the commons. Uh, and I think that, you know, hooks, hooks up interestingly with a lot of things going on nowadays with uh, intellectual property, where, uh, you know, Bill Gates accuses those of us who reject intellectual property of being communists. Well, okay, <laughs> so we're, we're communists. We're pro-market, pro-private property, free market communists. Sounds good. Sounds like a good, uh, well-reasoned place to be. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Long. It's been a pleasure. Look forward to speaking to you again in the future.